Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, and welcome to day two. Um, we had a wonderful day yesterday, and we're really honored to hear some more remarks and presentations from researchers, advocates, activists, tenants, and government officials. Today, we're also excited about an action-packed afternoon filled with elected officials working as allies to support all of the wonderful work that we here, with your help, will make happen. I'd like to bring up uh, our board member, uh, Dennis Derrick, to uh, open up with a few remarks. And Dennis, come on up. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I want to welcome you. Charles Allison, I can't see you out there. Is, OK, Charles Allison, another board member. We have actually dual roles. Uh, we not only serve on the board of uh, WE Act, but we're both faculty members at the new school. And so we're welcoming you, uh, and on behalf of all of our board members and the staff of WE Act, uh, to the, today's morning's session. Milano School has had a long history <clears throat> in working with affordable housing. As a matter of fact, uh, over 10 years, we have worked with affordable housing, and it's interesting what the driving force for many of those competitions were, and that is that you had to keep your cost at least $100 or a per square foot or less in terms of building affordable housing. So that the reality was, what you were being told was, it could be affordable, but it couldn't be healthy. And even the sizes of the rooms made no sense because I could see designs coming from other places in which Quite frankly, you couldn't even get a queen-size bed into some of those rooms and be able to walk around. But we've come a long way now in, in many ways, and I think one of the benchmarks for us in the Harlem community that involved the Milano School is really the Fortune Society and their new green building. Uh, the students here from this particular school uh, did the design, and the judges looked at $165 per square foot and essentially said, you can't do that. Well. The reality is it was done, the building has been built, most of you know it, next to the castle on 140th Street and Riverside Drive, and it has made a difference. Yesterday you heard a great deal about campaigns, and I think it's important to understand many of these campaigns, because as I think about and listen to the campaigns, they've actually had a major impact on my life uh, as a Harlem resident. I think of the clean air campaign, and I think of the sewer treatment plant, and I think about the final campaign with its poster that says, the air you breathe in this community may be dangerous to your health. And I think that that was a message that made, that was a transformative message for many members of this particular community. And I think that quite frankly, uh, we act in terms of what it has done as being a watchdog within this community has made all our lives very different. Couple of things that I think I just want to mention on a very personal level, because one of, other, one of the other campaigns that WEAC has had has to do with food in schools. And through that food in schools operation, uh, campaign, I got to learn a great deal about what the next major, what the other major disparities were in the community around access and affordability. It's interesting, both words, access and affordability, can transform itself both from food to housing. And it has made a difference in the sense that now over the last five years I have actually spent considerable time creating an organization called Corbin Hill Food Project that brings food to those who need it most within our particular communities. I just want to close because I know soon if I see Cecil standing there I know that my time is up. Uh, there are a few givens that I think we bring to this. One is that the indoor environment has a large impact on the health disparities in urban and rural uh, environments. And secondly, that the New York State Department of Health has classified housing as one of the social determinants of health uh, in terms of, uh, and the disparities that go with it as a key driver. And finally, we all know, and I'm not gonna say what that which is obvious, and that is that the communities of color and low income continue to be impacted by these disparities. This is what this conference is all about. Uh, and in a typical we act fashion, it's really one of action. So that all of the research that went on yesterday and some more of the framing that will go on today will be followed this afternoon by real action as we deal with the elected officials 
and those people in power who need to change their paradigm of how power should be used. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis, for helping us open the day. And I was selfishly saying that Dennis was a board member of WEAC, but Dennis is not only a board member of WEAC, he's our founding board chair, and he's also a leading luminary light here at the new school uh, for public engagement. So I want to thank Dennis. Um, I also want to uh, bring to the stage our longtime academic partner, Dr. Regina Santella. Uh, Dr. Santella yesterday welcomed us, and I'm going to ask her to come back again and welcome us today to the stage. Uh, Dr. Santella heads the uh, NIHS Center for Environmental Health in Northern Manhattan. Dr. Santella. Good morning. It's my pleasure to welcome the new people today, and I'm sorry if some of you were hearing my little brief intro twice, but um, the NIEHS Center is funded uh, by the National Institutes of Health, um, and so we are really looking at the combination of environmental and genetic factors and how they impact disease risk. Uh, we focus on several different diseases centered around neurologic diseases, both neurodevelopmental outcomes, you know, from birth. Uh, in, utero, in utero exposures through the life course exposures, their effects on uh, neurologic development, uh, neurologic diseases such as essential tremor, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. We have studies going on in cancer, uh, the environmental impacts, the effects of environmental exposures impacting on cancer risk. And the third area of research, which has been heavily done in collaboration with WEACT, is related to uh, respiratory diseases, specifically asthma. What I forgot to mention yesterday was where a large amount of our resources go, and that is to our so-called facility cores. And for example, we have an exposure assessment core that looks at uh, air levels of environmental pollutants. Uh, we do dust sampling and look at levels of environmental pollutants in dust sample. We even look at exhaled breath condensate, and, and you can use certain markers in exhaled breath condensate in relationship to asthma risk. We have another facility that looks at trace metals, uh, lead, which you all know about, arsenic, uh, manganese, so there are many toxic metals, uh, cadmium, to which we are exposed. And then we have a so-called biomarkers uh, facility where we process and store biological samples, saliva, blood, urine, uh, breast milk, uh, samples that we collect in our epidemiologic studies where we're trying to do population studies to understand at a population level uh, the impacts of environmental exposures on several different diseases. And so I'm thankful for our long-standing collaboration. I think it's over 20 years that we've had with WEACT, and it's, I think, been quite successful. And we are really interested in an interaction with the community and bringing your problems to us so that we can think of ways of researching them ultimately to find solutions to the problems. Thank you. Thank you, Regina. Um, we're really happy uh, that we've had some wonderful co conveners and sponsors and media sponsors for this event, and we want to thank them all. Uh, our conveners for the summit are the Columbia NIEHS Center for Environmental Health in Northern Manhattan, the Milano School of International Affairs, Management and Urban Policy, and our co-sponsors are the US EPA, Enterprise Community Partners, Inc., Tishman Environmental Design Center, LISC, New York City, the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, the New York State Energy and Research and Development Authority, and Columbia Center for Children's Environmental Health. Our media sponsors for our conference over these two days has been Manhattan, Manhattan Neighborhood Network and Marianne Liebert, Inc., the publishers of the Journal of Environmental Justice. Um, I'm actually really honored right now to bring forth Peggy Shepard. Peggy is our executive director and co-founder and has been the leading light behind our organization over the last 26 years that we have been in existence. She is our co-founder. She spends her time helping us uh, really think through the direction that the organization is going in and how we can critically impact our communities. And so I want to thank Peggy and bring her to the stage to lead us off today. Peggy. So good morning, everyone. It's great to see you out on such a Saturday. It's so early. Um, and I know uh, we'll be joined uh, later in the afternoon by many of our members. 
So over the last uh, couple of days, we've really been thinking about the challenges, the concerns we all have in terms of housing and health, and the opportunities that lay before us in beginning to achieve policies that are really more protective of us so that we can have healthy and safe homes. We Act has been thinking about these issues over the years. We first started, started out thinking about asthma and air pollution because we also understand that uh, we live in communities with, with traffic and trucks that are emitting diesel soot that really exacerbates asthma as well as cardiovascular disease for, for the older citizens. And we also understand that 80% of outdoor air goes indoors. And so we understand that not only ambient air indoors, but the allergens and toxins from lead and mold and other um, off-gassing from materials inside our homes are making many of us ill and exacerbating existing problems. So how do we begin to come together to develop the policies and procedures that will, will really be more protective? How do we confront power? How do we talk to our elected officials? How do we tell our personal stories to really um, magnify the issues as as our mayor now says that he's going to build much more affordable housing, but we need affordable housing that's self, uh, safe and healthy as well. So we act began thinking about the air quality issues, the asthma prevalence in a community like Harlem in northern Manhattan where we're based. And we began to realize that without engaging residents who are most affected by these issues, we cannot really make a difference. And so we really began uh, training parents about lead poisoning inside their homes. Um, we began uh, telling them how to tell their story. We began working with them and the elected officials. And we, over the years, developed a coalition. And we were able, together with many groups in New York City, develop the most protective lead poisoning law in, in the nation. And so we know that that kind of coalition building, that kind of community organizing can work to make a real difference and a change. And so that wa that's why we've brought so many of you all together over the last couple of days to begin to understand those challenges, hear those stories, and begin to develop protective policies. We're fortunate that there are a number of bills and policies that have already been introduced into the city council. And so we have the opportunity now to mobilize, to get our elected officials to support and pass those bills that will make a difference in our lives. And so that's really why we've come together today. And I hope we will be uh, joined by our elected city council persons uh, and city agencies as well, so that we can have and hear some accountability for the issues that we're all so concerned about. So thank you uh, very much for engaging with us. I hope you all will sign on to uh, our coalition, our Coalition for Healthy Homes, and support the variety of uh, protective policies that are being um, put forward by so many of the base building community organizations around this city, some of whom um, you heard from uh, yesterday afternoon. So again, um, welcome, and I look forward to our discussions over the day. Thank you, Peggy. Um, next, I'd like to bring forward WEAC's federal policy analyst, Dr. Jalan White Newsom. Uh, Dr. White Newsom has been holding down WEAC's Washington, D.C. office and really building a presence for us. She is, in her own right, an expert in climate issues, looking especially at vulnerable populations and how heat impacts them. So, Dr. White Newsom, come forward. Thank you, Jalan. Thanks, Cecil. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, we can do better than that. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Aren't you all excited? Yeah. How many of you all were here yesterday? Oh, fantastic. So you already know that there's been some great conversation, some great education, uh, telling of great research and strategy to get at exactly what WE Act has been doing for the past 26 years, um, using research and advocacy for action. So um, thank you all for being here, and thanks again to 
Oganaya, our environmental health director, um, Peggy Shepard, the entire WEAC staff, interns, volunteers, and thanks to you all for being here. So again, I spoke briefly yesterday about the importance of home, and I'm not gonna give you the same spiel as yesterday, but I think Again, as we talked yesterday about what a healthy home is and the connections between health and home, um, it became very clear. And I learned so much yesterday, but when I think about my definition of a healthy home, uh, it's more than kind of getting to home like Dorothy was trying to do in The Wizard of Oz, but it's a place where, again, I'm comfortable, I'm safe. Uh, it's a place where lead and toxins aren't present. It's a place where, you know, unwanted moisture and pests aren't there. It's a place where falling and tripping hazards aren't a common thing. It's a place where it's not too hot and it's not too cold and the structure is resilient to changes in our climate. And so that's the definition of healthy home. And I learned so much yesterday from the great speakers about all the things that, that make up a healthy home. So children like little Jessica that I talked about yesterday from my hometown of Detroit that unfortunately had been exposed to many unhealthy factors in her home or the multiple homes she had been in, uh, you know, was a result of, of policies and procedures not being in place to protect those that are most vulnerable. Um, she had been exposed to those visible and invisible threats because there's some things that you can't see that are just as harmful. And of course, lower income areas in the city of Detroit, just like in Harlem and other places, you have these same threats. But what's so encouraging is that um, that's not the end of Jessica's story. Jessica, like many folks in our communities around here, uh, it, it, it doesn't stop, and, and that's why you all are here today. Essentially, with education, with intervention, and with action and advocacy, we can change the story of Jessica, we can change the stories of a lot of folks, and, and that starts with everybody in this room. So I have the distinct pleasure of working on federal policy in WEACT's DC office, and the goal and, and really the mission of WEACT uh, translates to DC in that all the policies and all the wonderful things that happen in DC uh, sometimes fail to have an equity component. They fail to really understand environmental justice and make policies as protective as possible. And so what I try to do is kind of change that and shift that paradigm and make folks understand that we can't keep doing things the way that we've been doing them so we can be more protective of our communities. And so as an advocate, sometimes we're not well resourced. I'm not as well resourced as some of our lobby friends, but it doesn't matter. The goal is to get into those rooms and have those conversations with these people that can make sustainable change. And so you all have a great opportunity this afternoon, just a couple hours of now, to have a voice and, and have that power with people that can make those sustainable changes in policies that you need to be protective of communities. So guess what? You all are in the room. You have the voices, you have the power, you have the platform today to demand sustainable, safe, and healthy homes. So use it. Talk with the leaders, make them accountable, because that's what it's about. So I encourage you to take advantage of the space, take advantage of the experts, take advantage of the people, and most importantly, realize that it doesn't take resources to, to, to have an impact. Your voice is just as important as anybody, and, and you can do that. So again, thanks for the opportunity. I look forward to the next couple of hours, and again, let's demand sustainable change and support this Healthy Homes campaign. Have a great day. Thank you, Jalan. Um, we really can continue to be impressed with all the amazing work that Jalan does. Uh, next, I would like to introduce a longtime ally of the U.S. Uh, of ours uh, of, at the U.S. EPA, Mr. Mustafa Ali, uh, and Mustafa is going to kick us off with the first panel session as the moderator. Mustafa. As you heard from uh, Administrator Gina McCarthy yesterday, is the most critical voice at the EPA when it comes to environmental justice issues. And he has a long and storied history of working effectively with communities, and we really want to thank him for that. And with that, we'll let all the other panelists who are with him come forth as well. Mustafa. I didn't know the lights were going to be this bright up here. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. See, I didn't have to say it twice, did I? Uh, usually I have to ask folks if they had their Starbucks coffee 
or the Krispy Kreme donuts, because sometimes you go in some situations and the energy level is a, is a little low, but I knew that wasn't going to be the case here today with WEAC and, and all the other folks who have pulled this fantastic event together. So last night I was sitting in bed and I was thinking about the panel that we're going to kick off this morning. And I thought about all the folks that were here yesterday and uh, coming from different communities, different nationalities, uh, different occupations. And I started to think about the tapestry of the work that we do in social justice and environmental justice and, and housing justice and transportation justice and all the various things that come together. And I was listening to Peggy and to Jalan and, and Cecil and some other folks, and I was thinking about the conversation that we're going to have this morning. And I was thinking about how a healthy home is the foundation from which everything else springs from. It's almost like in our families, our mother. And when the mother is not there or is not a central figure or part of the process of how the family moves forward, there's always that gap that's there. So we're thankful for the mothers. But also, when we don't have a healthy home, how can we ever have healthy education? How can we ever have a healthy environment? How can we have healthy jobs? All those things that are a part of that tapestry that makes us complete as a community, as a neighborhood, as a country, starts with the home. So we're very blessed today. One that Peggy and others thought that we should have this session, but we have an opportunity also to frame out some of the conversations that will come from what we're going to do here this morning. We're also very blessed that, uh, I should say that I'm blessed because in working on environmental justice issues for the last couple of decades, one of the lessons I learned early on from a number of the leaders was that communities speak for themselves. And that's why it's important that you're here today. And Jalan had spoke to the fact that you have power power in making the changes, raising the expectations, and demanding certain things that should be a part of our communities. And we have a set of experts here today to help us to start to move forward in thinking about that process. So I'm going to ask everybody one question. How many folks in the room have a pen or a pencil? Just raise your hand if you have a pen or a pencil. Because I want to see the person who didn't bring one. <laughs> now, we do have those folks now who have technology. I know you use your iPads and, and some of the other things. But that's important in this process, because if we're serious about making change inside of our communities, that means that we have to start to be strategic in how we're moving forward. And WEAC has a plan for that, and many of the other folks who are here are a part of that process. But that means that you need to be taking notes, but you also need to take advantage of the speakers and the experts that you have to ask those, those real probing questions. That's why they're here, so that you can ask the tough questions. So we have experts on the stage this morning who focus on medicine, we have experts who focus on law, we have experts who focus on engineering, and we have experts who focus on science. So is that a, a panel that you might want to hear from? Yes. This means yes. Okay. So real quickly, I want to tell you uh, some of the folks who are in front of you, and then we're going to bring them forward. But I also want to sort of frame out for you what this panel will focus on. This panel will focus on a number of diverse programs that highlight the need to understand the intersection between advocacy clinical practice, the trainings of professionals, and the weatherization programs that exist. The panelists will present their work in the relationship to how their own pieces help to create, sustain, and preserve healthy homes and communities for all of New Yorkers. We're going to have our panelists, uh, Dr. Maida Galvez. Uh, we have panelists Gavin Kearney, panelist Dan Reber, and panelist David Newman. So let me as folks are about to come forward, talk to you about our first panelist. Uh, Dr. Maida Galvez is a board certified pediatrician. She completed the Academic Pediatric Association sponsored fellowship in environmental pediatrics at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York. She is currently an associate professor in the Department of Preventative Medicine and Pediatrics. She directs Mount Sinai's Region 2 Pediatrics Environmental Health Specialty Unit and practices general pediatrics. She is the co-principal investigator and a designated new investigator entitled Growing Up Healthy in East Harlem, a community-based research project examining childhood obesity. So everyone, please put your hands together for Dr. Galvez. 
Uh, it's really great to be here today with all of you on this lovely Saturday in fall. Um, so I'm a pediatrician at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, uh, direct the Region 2 Peds Environmental Health, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that we do there in children's environmental health. And so one of the most common questions I get is, what do you do? <laughs> And so, you know, what, what I do as an environmental pediatrician is really try to help families understand environmental exposures, whether it's in their home, their school, or their community. Um, and we think of environment very broadly. So um, this is an image by my colleague, Cappy Collins, showing that environment not only encompasses uh, chemical exposures that we may experience in our daily lives in those um, settings where we live, learn, eat, sleep, and play, but it also encompasses neighborhood factors, including your schools, uh, the resources that exist within your communities, including uh, potential sources of exo exposure like diesel bus um, depots. And so I'm part of a network at Mount Sinai. It's a national network. It's funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Environmental Protection Agency. Um, and so there are pediatricians that you can turn to if you have questions in your community. Um, they're located in each federal region. Uh, our region happens to be uh, Region 2, which encompasses New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, and the US Virgin Islands. Um, and there's a toll-free number that you can call if you have questions. So you can take the pencil out now and write our number. It's 866-265-6201. And so if you have any questions about exposures in your home, or if you're dealing with a family through your community-based organization that has concerns where you think a pediatrician could be helpful in advocating or pointing them to resources or that we can act as a referral source, um, please give us a call, because I got a call from a family last Friday, and they were talking about acute allergic um, symptoms that the family had to be experienced that then developed into chronic symptoms. And so these um, exposures, um, these symptoms have been happening for over a year. And the family had been seen by a number of specialists, including ear, nose, and throat doctors, and allergy and immunolo immunology doctors. And not one person who that family had seen had thought to ask about the home environment. And um, it was actually somebody who came in to clean the windows that said, when they were overheard a discussion about the AC duct, that said, you should look inside the ducts of the, ho of the home and see if there's an exposure there. And they actually found construction-related debris that had been blowing throughout the home for over a year, causing the allergic symptoms. And the family was really disappointed that nobody had asked. And that is the common scenario, is that healthcare providers really aren't trained in the area of environmental pediatrics. And so too often, we fail to ask. And so all of you are actually frontline um, in helping to identify those families and then can refer to us who can help those families get some of the answers that they're seeking. So um, that's why I'm so thrilled to be here today um, talking with this incredibly diverse group because I think that the way that we can be most effective as pediatricians is in working with the community partners who can help us identify the families that are most at risk because they're not calling us. Um, so uh, please do pick up that phone and, and, and use that number. We're one 265 6201 um, we're, we're also fortunate in that um, we have some funding through the New York State Center of Excellence in Children's Environmental Health, so there's now a network of environmental pediatric champions in each major city in New York State, Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, Albany, Valhalla, New York City, and Stony Brook. Um, and so the activities that we do are, are pretty broad. It's clinical consultations. It could be as simple as I'm concerned about this exposure in my home, what should I do, to there's a piece of legislation that's... Um, that's been proposed and uh, what can we do uh, to support that. Um, and so there's a number of things that you can reach out to us for. And, and this is really rooted in the concept that um, neighborhood impacts health. And you've heard that over and over from distinguished speakers at this conference. Um, and so you look at these maps and the neighborhoods that are most impacted tend to be low income minority communities, whether it's childhood lead poisoning, you look at the areas that are dark blue here. Um, which include uh, the lead belt, for example, in Bed-Stuy, um, to poor housing and asthma. So the maps are the same, whether you look at asthma um, or birth outcomes or um, lead poisoning. 
And so this is an example of a case that came to us um, where we did a home visit, and uh, it shows you how when a problem is not properly addressed, um, how rapidly um, that problem progresses. So here are successive photos of a single bathroom on the left um, over time and the child's bedroom. And this family also had um, children with asthma whose symptoms were exacerbated by the presence of mold in the home. And we can see um, in our case um, consultations that these cases actually languish, unfortunately, in, in the housing court, and, and Gavin can tell us a little bit more about that, but the recent success of um, our colleagues and partners um, in terms of using the American Disability Act to address um, housing and health uh, for chil children and their families living in public housing is a tremendous success for environmental health. I'm gonna rapidly go through the next. These are the resources that we give to families are the very resources that the Department of Health um, probably showed you yesterday. So the integrated pest management brochure, these are all available through 311, fixed lead paint hazards, and some um, impacts of secondhand smoke. This is from the New York City Coalition for a Smoke-Free City. So these are really what we consider to be the top exposures um, in the home. Um, and then outside the home, the places for play for children. And what do they look like? And then why aren't there children out there? Um, it's something that I'm constantly looking for when I'm out in the community, is where are the, where are the children? And so we've done some research in this area, and we've, we've shown that diversity makes a difference. So having a variety of activities um, encourages children to use those, those play spaces. Safe routes to school, very important issue for us. Um, and so it's, we've seen some gains here in the city with the recent reduction in um, speed limit. Um, and access to food stores, so really thinking about healthy homes and healthy communities. And we show that access to high calorie junk foods actually increases purchases of a children on their way home from school. And this impacts overall dietary quality. And so I've talked about healthy homes, healthy communities, but we also focus on the chemical exposure, and phthalates exposure is one area um, that we've uh, been involved in, and it uh, includes building supply, building materials, and PVC, polyvinyl chloride materials, um, are found in many homes, and they can create dust and off-gas and then expose um, families. And so we've done a lot of outreach and education in emerging chemicals of exposure. And this has resulted in a pilot study with WEACT where um, we're actually going into the home and we're identifying what the families are using and um, have done some indoor air sampling. And our goal is actually to do an intervention where we do a targeted, um, uh, switch of, um, of, for example, cleaning supplies and see if that reduces um, their exposures to phthalates, for example. Dr. Dick Jackson is a pediatrician that has championed designing, health commu designing healthy communities on a national level. And what he's really done is he's expanded the conversation of, um, of design and how that impacts health. And so what he's, what he's been able to do is actually broaden the conversation and say that together we're all, we can all affect change um, and all major public health interventions have required partnerships. Um, so it's why I'm so thrilled to be here today. Um, and so we look forward to working with you and to ideas about how we can better engage healthcare providers in identifying at-risk families. Thank you. So you see Cecil starting to get closer, you know what that means, right? <laughs> okay, so we're gonna move on. Uh, what we're gonna do is, after all of our presenters have had a chance to go through their information, then we're uh, going to open it up to questions that I know that you are writing down. So our next speaker is Gavin Kearney. He's the Director of the Environmental Justice Program at New York Lawyers for Public Interest. He provides legal assistance to low-income communities and communities of color in New York City on environmental and land use issues. These communities are disproportionately burdened by noxious and undesirable land uses and deprived of beneficial land uses. We work to strengthen communities' ability to assert their right to a healthy environment, while at the same time promoting community-driven economic redevelopment, affordable housing, open space, and community services. Let's welcome Gavin. Great, uh, good morning. 
That wasn't a test of your response skills, but nice job nonetheless. Um, so uh, thanks for the introduction, Mustafa. Uh, I'm Gavin Carney. Uh, I won't say what Mustafa just said, but really quickly want to tell you a little bit about New York Lawyers for the Public Interest and then get into the substance of, uh, of the presentation today. So uh, New York Lawyers has three program areas, environmental justice, health justice, disability justice, all focused on uh, ensuring that communities and individuals in New York City have access to, to opportunity, access to healthy environments, et cetera. I should also plug that we operate a pro bono clearinghouse, uh, which is designed to match law firms with uh, individuals and organizations in need of free legal assistance. That can be anything from helping a nonprofit incorporate to uh, you know, internal transactional needs to, to what have you. So I want to put that out there as a, as a resource that folks uh, may find useful. Uh, one thing that's worth emphasizing about our organization and which you'll see, uh, I'll provide some examples of when I get into the substance of it, is that we use a community lawyering model. And I think this is really essential to doing all of our work, but it's particularly essential to doing environmental justice work. What that means to us is multifaceted advocacy. So we do litigation, but we do a lot of policy advocacy. We do organizing. We do media advocacy. Uh, we, and we work in partnership with community-based organizations and coalitions. Uh, sometimes lawyers, you guys all know the expression that if you're a hammer, the whole world looks like a nail. Uh, if you're a lawyer, sometimes the whole world looks like potential litigation opportunities. Uh, we try to, to view the world a little bit more holistically and really work with uh, coalitions and communities to develop solutions that work for them. Uh, and oftentimes that's solutions that the legal system does not provide. So in terms of uh, the diverse perspectives that our panel is going to offer, I think mine is diverse not just in the sense that I'm a lawyer, but also because I'm going to talk primarily about school environments, uh, which I think are essential to any discussion about indoor environmental health. One, because of how much time kids, teachers, school personnel spend in schools every year, uh, about 180 days per year, as you can see on my PowerPoint. Uh, and in particular, I think from the perspective of kids, this is critical because as we all know, uh, children are particularly uh, vulnerable to environmental hazards. But I also think it's useful to talk about because some of the lessons that we've learned over the time in terms of uh, effectively addressing environmental health issues, environmental justice issues in a school setting may also have some utility for the, for the housing setting as well. So, in what context do environmental concerns arise when you're talking about schools? This is something that I actually didn't expect until we started to work on this. But first, in New York City, as everybody knows, land is scarce and land is valuable. And oftentimes, land that's vacant and affordable to the Department of Education, to the city, is land that has a history of contamination. Uh, and this is particularly true in, in environmental justice communities because of the industrial legacy that many of these communities uh, have. And so New York City routinely cites schools on properties that have uh, significant degrees of environmental contamination. It's funny, Maida and I served on a, an EPA uh, working group several years ago that was, that was tasked with coming up with healthy school siting guidelines on a national level. And one of the things folks talked about, one of the sort of threshold decisions was, well, uh, don't cite schools on contaminated property. Uh, you know, if you have a couple of different choices and one of them is clean land and the other is contaminated land, choose the clean land, which is, you know, you don't need to be a scientist to know that that makes sense. In New York City, that's not an option. It's you choose the less dirty land if you can, but, uh, but New York school, uh, but vacant land in New York City is, is largely contaminated. Environmental concerns also arise in the context of school renovations. Um, a lot of our older buildings still have asbestos in place, have other toxins in place. And then one of the uh, big campaigns that our, that our office just worked on in partnership with a number of uh, community members and, and organizations was around the presence of toxins in schools, specifically PCBs or polychlorinated biphenyls, which is a man-made chemical that was banned by the EPA in the 70s, but still continues to exist in New York City schools. Uh, so our key goals in doing this work, and I think this is, this is true of a lot of the housing work as well, 
minimize health and exposure risk to kids, to school personnel, educate and engage parents and other stakeholders to ensure accountability and long-term safety. From our perspective, students, parents, school personnel have a right to know about the environmental threats that exist in the schools that they, that they go to. Uh, oversight agencies, the Department of Education, the city don't always agree that there's a right to know. There are sometimes uh, the response you get is, well, it's probably better if people don't know because we don't want to be alarmist. That's not always, it's, it's a complicated question. Mike and I were actually just talking about it a little bit beforehand. But, but we feel like folks ought to be educated about this. They ought to understand the risks. Uh, and it ought to be presented in a way that's accessible and that, that folks can, act, that can, can make meaningful decisions with. So what have we been able to accomplish? Um, we have gotten New York City to, uh, in the context of PCBs, New York City currently has these antiquated light fixtures that use PCBs as an insulator within the lighting fixture. These exist in all the schools. Folks have probably seen some of the press coverage around it. They leak. Uh, because they're so old, they periodically just spontaneously explode. Um, and they also, uh, in, a, in a more, uh, Common sense, they just regularly sort of emit PCBs into the, into the air of schools. We fought for years with New York Communities for Change, with parents' associations, with elected officials. Uh, we litigated, we used media, we used mobilization tactics to get the city to commit to removing PCB contaminated light fixtures from all New York City schools by the end of 2016. We've also worked in partnership with community groups to get significantly strengthened cleanup plans at individual school sites. And I'll talk a little bit about one of those in a second. And I know I'm probably going to run out of time pretty quickly. Um, we also have a bill that's going through the council right now that we think is going to pass. I don't want to jinx it. But it's intro 126 of 2014. Uh, you can get it online from the city council website. I'd also be, be happy to share it with folks if uh, folks are interested. And I'll, I'll put my email address up again at the end. And what this bill will do is it requires that any time the Department of Education does environmental testing in a school, those test results need to go up onto their website in a way that parents and students and personnel can access. And any time those test results exceed established health thresholds, any time they exceed uh, established thresholds of what an acceptable risk is, they need to notify parents and personnel within seven days of those test results and they need to explain to them what they're going to do to address the issue. Uh, briefly, what I think has been keys to our success, and this is, I think, uh, will resonate, and this isn't news to a lot of people in the audience, organization, organizing and coalition building is critical. Parents, teachers, unions that represent school personnel, elected officials, all of these things happen through mobilization. It's not because you have uh, the smartest scientists, the smartest lawyers, what have you, those things help, but it's really about mobilization. Technical experts are essential. One of the things that happens in these contexts, people have probably experienced it, is you raise an environmental health concern and the response you get from the oversight agency is, oh, you're crazy. That's not a real risk. What do you, you know, you guys are just being, uh, you're being sensational. Technical experts are essential to, to understanding yourself what the risks are and making informed decisions about how to move forward. They're essential in terms of engaging on that terrain. When you have agency officials telling you, oh, this isn't something to be concerned about or we're dealing with it, trust us, you need that expertise so that you can, act, that expertise that you do actually trust to help you push back. Litigation, as I said, can be helpful, not essential. Media exposure can be highly effective. Uh, nobody looks good in the city when you're telling them that they're putting kids at risk. I'm actually less than a minute, so I'm going to skip the brief case study because I want to just quickly plug something that we recently did. Uh, we've done a, a series of uh, guidance documents and pamphlets for, uh, for community members, for parents, for students concerned about environmental health in their schools. Uh, it's a project that was supported by the New York State Health Foundation. This is a, uh, the cover of the, our first publication in the series around safe school renovation. We have series around siting, series around understanding environmental hazards in schools. Uh, these are in the process of getting put up on our website, which is listed there as uh, nylpi.org. Uh, if anybody's interested in them uh, and want them right away, shoot me an email. My email address is at the bottom there. These tools are really designed to help folks understand what environmental risks exist in their schools 
and understand what rights they have under existing laws and regulations and understand what tools they can use to push for transparent and effective uh, cleanups, renovation practices, et cetera, in their schools. It's really, they're really geared towards uh, advancing advocacy and helping people uh, ensure that their school environments are healthy. So I'll stop there. Thank you. All right. So our next speaker, I know everyone is going to have some questions for once he is done because he's the gentleman who focuses on the weather and weatherization and those types of things. And we all know we've been having some crazy stuff lately. With that being said, Dan Reber is from the Northern Manhattan Improvement Corporation and has over 26 years of experience working in the field of energy efficiency. For four years, Mr. Reber performed energy audits and was a construction manager in the multifamily buildings for the weatherization development of New York City Housing Preservation and Development and Energy Conservation Division. That's a lot of words. <laughs> Currently, Mr. Reber serves as the weatherization director at the Northern Manhattan Improvement Corporation. In that capacity, he continues conducting energy audits and construction management for the weatherization assistance program at NMIC. Dan is also an active board member of the Association for Energy Affordability, and for the last 19 years, and for the past six years, a member of the NYSWDA Board of Directors. You're going to have to tell us what that means. <laughs> Dan is a certified as an EPA-led paint supervisor and has a BA degree from the State University of New York at Stony Brook. And Dan has presented at past ACI conferences, national and regional WAP conferences, NSEA Boston slash NYC, and at each of the multifamily conferences held in NYC and Chicago. So Dan, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Come on up. Thanks, Mustafa. Uh, it's nice to be on this panel. Great to be here at the conference. Uh, I'm Dan Reber with Northern Manhattan Improvement Corporation. Uh, we're also known as NIMIC. Uh, you can check out our website at nmic.org uh, and see all the uh, social service programs that we provide uh, to the Washington Heights and Inwood communities. And uh, so we don't take too much time here. We're going to uh, breeze through the presentation. Uh, so, weatherization uh, assistance program, who here has heard of it? Raise your hand. Okay, that's actually a lot in my experience. <laughs> so, good for you. Um, it is one of the best kept, sec best kept secrets um, around. A lot of people don't know about what we do. Um, this is a federal program through the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, it's been around for over 35 years, believe it or not. Um, stemmed out of the oil embargoes of the 70s and the need to uh, save energy, uh, and uh, it's going strong now. So there's our little logo there. That's our Weatherization Works logo. We're very proud of it. Uh, that's the national symbol. Uh, the Weatherization Assistance Program is an energy conservation program for low-income people. Um, here in Manhattan, we're serving people who mostly, 99.9% .9 live in multifamily buildings that are often uh, pre-war construction, and that's pre-World War II for you younger folks. Um, and here you can see what constitutes a low-income uh, family or person. Uh, these are the income guidelines. They are 60% of state median. Uh, that's different than what we often hear of as um, area median income, which is a much higher number. So this is really meant for a really low-income uh, person or family. Uh, I should also mention that the program is administered at the state level by New York State Homes and Community Renewal, um, used to be known as DHCO or the Division of Homes and Community Renewal. They administer the program at the state level um, and uh, give out the funds to all the subgrantees like ourselves around the, around the state, of which there are about 60. So how does the weatherization program create a more healthy home? Um, here are 10 points. Um, that as part of what we do normally, um, we're actually helping to create, um, we feel, a healthier home. Um, I often say it's almost by accident um, because we're in the house, in the apartment, in the building with energy conservation and health and safety in mind. Um, health and safety is something that we're always um, keen on being aware of. And so you can see we're air sealing, we're tuning up heating plants, we're identifying water leaks, whether it's inside or outside, um, 
fine tune the heating distribution system. Um, earlier it was mentioned about, you know, is it too, too cold or too hot in the apartment? You know, these are things we're very, uh, want to be uh, made aware of by the residents who live there, the superintendent. Um, cleaning and sealing mechanical ventilation systems. Buildings that are um, post-war, post-World War II, um, often are built with mechanical ventilation systems because their kitchens and bathrooms do not have windows. And so therefore, um, we look at those uh, as well. Upgrade lighting in the common areas and inside the apartments. Uh, we insulate the roof deck uh, or the roof cavity, and in, if we're lucky enough in rehab projects, uh, wall cavities. And the great thing about um, the insulation we use is that it's a sustainable product. It's called cellulose. If, who's here has heard of cellulose as an insulation product? Excellent, all right. Um, so you know that that's a recycled product. It's made from recycled newspaper uh, treated with a borate uh, fired retardant. And, and so that, as opposed to using, say, spray foams um, or even fiberglass, which um, have more toxic uh, characteristics. Um, and then painting roofs white to reduce their um, summer heat load, and repair and replacing windows. And in some uh, certain situations, we can actually provide air conditioners for clients who have health issues um, during extreme weather in the, in the summer. So the, the rest of these slides are going to be visual. I'm a visual person. Um, and so to sh give examples about the kinds of things that we do in apartments. So here's examples of air conditioner sleeves um, architects still design buildings with giant holes in their walls for some reason, and so um, we often find we have to seal them up. Um, so here's an example of an air conditioner sleeve, one where we're sealing with foam. Uh, this is going out to a patio there on the, on the top right. Um, here's an inside picture sealing around the perimeter of the air conditioner to reduce drafts, then covering the spray foam with an aluminum tape, and then another example is a um, a cover that actually fits over the air conditioner itself. Again, these are for through-the-wall sleeve units. Um, air sealing is a big part of what we do. Air sealing has um, the great benefit of stopping air movement between apartments through what we call interstitial spaces. Those are the spaces between apartments or uh, walls. Um, so you can see the insulation under the sink here. This is an often a place where there's lots of holes because plumbers and People think, well, nobody can see it, so I can just leave the hole there. Um, then to your right there is a, is a radiator, a, um, uh, a radiator that's rather dusty. Um, and there are also holes in those convector cabinets that can be sealed up as well, which you'll see here. Um, an example of uh, radiators, whether they're in convector cabinets or they're a, a, a cast iron baseboard type, which are on the top of this picture, um, there's often holes that can be sealed up. And the great thing is not only are we stopping air movement, but we're um, stopping pathways for rodents and insects at the same time. Um, whether there's a problem there or not, more often there is. Um, and so that's a, a great benefit to the, uh, the residents. Um, here's just a common area picture of whether we're um, sealing up the windows or weather stripping doors uh, to reduce the uh, infiltration of cold air uh, into the building. Uh, this is uh, just a picture of a new steam boiler that um, we will often install when a new heating system is called for. One of the things we try to do is reduce the building's carbon footprint. More often than not, the building's heating systems are oversized and they are just put in by heating contractors that just put, put in like with like instead of looking at the actual heat load of the building that like we do and the way it should be done um, to size right the heating system for the building, therefore reducing the building's energy output, its carbon footprint, and the amount of pollution that it's going to generate. Uh, part of what we do also is um, encouraging and really saying to building owners, um, if you're already burning number six oil, you know, it's going to be something you can't use very soon, and we should get you over to number two oil at the very least, and if gas is an option, um, you know, we get them converted to natural gas. Um, this is just a quick picture of an old style domestic hot water mixing valve, which mixes the water, uh, hot water from the boiler with cold water to send 120 degree water upstairs. These are brand new high efficiency heating systems um, that we've installed. These systems have anywhere up to 90% efficiency, uh, so they're, they're really reducing the building's carbon footprint. 
There's an electronic mixing valve, which is an updated version of the old one you just saw. Hot water storage tanks. Pipe insulation and heating distribution. Um, uh, fixes, as you were, the big green thing there on the right is an air vent, which allows air uh, to leave the steam system so steam can get up to the residents more quickly and more efficiently so people don't have to wait long for their heat to get up to their apartments. Insulating pipes in the basement uh, allows the heat to stay in the pipes and get upstairs again as opposed to being dissipated in the basement. This is the cellulose I mentioned before that gets blown into roof cavities. Again, uh, insulating those top floor apartments um, and keeping them even actually cooler in summertime as well, especially if they have a light colored roof like that one. And then the mechanical ventilation systems that I mentioned earlier, um, this is a nice overview of, of a project we did. And you know, if you imagine a shaft going down um, anywhere from six or as many as 20 or 30, this building here had um, close to 40 stories, was the largest project we ever worked on. And the shafts themselves are often um, have holes in them. Um, they need to be cleaned because they're very dirty. And so we clean them, we seal them, so that they can work properly uh, for the residents once again. Uh, there's a, I'm sure many of us have seen these in an apartment at one time or another. That's a dirty register. And there's a look at what it looks like when you take the grill off. So we're cleaning these guys right here. And then windows, uh, we do replace windows and repair them. So um, I look forward to your questions. Um, it's hard to cram all that in in just a few minutes, um, and thank you. I almost forgot I was in New York for a second, sneaking up behind Dan like that. He was like, hey, hey, what's going on, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> I saw you out of the corner of my eye. <laughs> okay, good. And Dan, I, I, I saw all the folks who were taking notes while you were speaking, so I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions. And, oh, and some of the folks are wrapped up in the front room, so they're like, so what's up with the energy efficiency? So. It is a little chilly. <laughs> OK. <laughs> all right, so our final speaker today is, uh, is Dave Newman. And, and, and Dave has seen some things. And by the time you, he gets done with his presentation, I think you will know what I mean by that. Dave Newman uh, is with the New York Committee for Occupational Safety and Health. Um, which is NICOSH. He's an industrial hygienist. He's conduct on-site evaluations of environmental and occupational safety and health hazards, including exposure assessments, sampling and interpretation of sampling results, and options for hazard controls. Dan courted NICOSH's World Trade Center Health and Safety Project and served on the EPA's World Trade Center Expert Technical Review Panel and served on the Exposure Assessment Working Group of the WTC Worker and Volunteer Medical Screening Programs. He has published numerous articles in peer-reviewed journals. Dave holds a master's degree in labor studies in environmental and occupational health sciences, and he is a member of the American Industrial Hygiene Association, the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists, and the American Public Health Associations. He served as the chief steward for both the Communication Workers of America and the United Steel Workers. Let's give him a round of applause. Good morning. Congratulations to WEACT for sponsoring this, for putting this event together, and congratulations to all of you for being part of it. So, there's a very clear but often overlooked intersection between healthy home issues, disaster preparedness, and occupational and environmental health issues. After all, aren't we all talking about toxic use reduction and environmental health and safety? In most circumstances, we have the luxury, like this morning, this is a luxury really, of discussing these concerns almost at our leisure. That's not to say they're not pressing, uh, but they're not pressing in certain ways. In a disaster scenario, such as an extreme weather event like Hurricane Sandy, we don't have that luxury of leisure and time. These issues come barreling out of hiding, and they assert themselves overtly and brazenly, and they make themselves readily apparent. So I'm, I'm grateful for this opportunity this morning to talk briefly about disaster preparedness, environmental health and safety, and healthy homes. So the first thing to know is, as, as I'm sure we all do already, is that uh, Extreme weather events disproportionately impact low-income communities and communities of color. Uh, so Hurricane Sandy, for example, um, disproportionately impacted our city's most vulnerable populations, low-income people, people of color, and the elderly, 
in communities that are already overburdened with an unfair share of toxic contaminants and health issues. In addition to the dispro disproportionate impact of the storm on low wage and minority communities, residents often had the dual impact of being displaced or impacted by the storm and also working as disaster workers or volunteers when they returned home. Hurricane Sandy destroyed or damaged 9% of the housing stock of New York City, including 76,000 buildings with over 300,000 housing units, of which 248 were subsidized low-income buildings and 800 were privately owned unsubsidized buildings with more than 40,000 rent-stabilized apartments. Sandy also damaged over 400 New York City Housing Authority buildings, affecting 35,000 units and 80,000 NYCHA residents who lost power, heat, and hot water for at least two weeks and in many cases for much longer. 397 elevators and 200 and high, 201 high-rise buildings were out of service. 24 temporary boilers and 100 generators helped restore heat and electricity, but at the same time exposed or potentially exposed tenants to elevated levels of carbon monoxide and noise. NYCHA acknowledged that over 5,000 apartments had excess mold growth as a result of the storm, but independent surveys indicated that number was severely underreported. In addition, more than 600,000 people live and work in largely low-income communities of color that the city designates as SMIAs, Significant Maritime and Industrial Areas. As you can see from the map, these areas coincide precisely with storm surge areas. These are densely populated areas directly adjacent to heavy industrial facilities and polluting infrastructures. These SMI SMIAs are also located in Hurricane Zone A, making them particularly vulnerable to Category 1 storm surges. The communities are host to Superfund sites, toxic waste facilities, sewage plants, landfills, and other chemical and waste storage facilities, all of which are vulnerable in an extreme weather event. So, how might individuals, residents, workers, et cetera, be exposed during an extreme weather event. The first is your exposure as a resident, worker, or in some other role during the storm event itself. The second is exposure as a resident or worker after the storm event, but before cleanup and remediation. Do you stay in your apartment? Do you stay in your house? Do you stay in your workplace? How, is that, how has that workplace been impacted? What are the potentials for exposure during that period? The third is, what are your exposures as a resident or a worker or a volunteer during the cleanup and remediation process itself? Because these processes are not always safe and they're not always effective. And the fourth is, because they're not always safe and effective, what is your exposure potentially after the cleanup, if the cleanup was not adequately complete? So mold. Mold was the primary health hazard associated with the aftermath of, of Hurricane Sandy event. Uh, the health hazards of mold, many of you are probably familiar with them. They include allergic reactions, such as dermatitis, uh, skin rash and itch, asthma attacks, either new onset asthma or uh, exacerbation of existing asthma, allergic rhinitis or sinitis, which means runny nose, nasal or sinus congestion, throat and eye irritation, cough, or more rarely, more serious conditions, such as chest tightness, difficulty breathing, cough, fever, and muscle aches. Fungal infections from exposure to mold can also occur and are much more serious, but are also much more rare. The groups who are most at risk of health harm from mold exposure are those who have other allergies, have existing respiratory conditions such as asthma or other respiratory diseases, are elderly or are immunocompromised. Sewage is an often overlooked uh, issue with regard to uh, um, um, severe weather events. Sewage is untreated water that contains raw animal or human body fluids, fecal matter, or other organic contaminants. Heavy rains can and do overwhelm the combined systems of collecting storm and precipitation water runoff and wastewater from water treatment plants, causing the discharge of unrelated sewers into the rivers. On this map, you can see the several hundred CSOs. These are, these are engineered and implemented uh, systems designed to 
discharge contaminated, polluted, or sewage-containing water into the, into the uh, New York City area's uh, rivers in the event of a severe thunderstorm or other severe weather event. So this discharge happens all the time, and it's every one of these combined uh, sewer overcharges uh, discharged during Hurricane Sandy. And you can see on the slide some of the figures for sewage that we are potentially exposed to. So catastrophic flooding like that caused by, by Sandy can introduce sewage from external sources into the indoor environment. This sewage can pose serious health threats to building occupants and to cleanup and restoration workers, including illnesses ranging from gastrointestinal infections, acute respiratory infections, and skin infections, to, in worst case circumstances, dysentery, infectious hepatitis, and severe gastroenteritis. Asbestos. It's estimated that significant amount of asbestos are present in roughly 20% of all residential and commercial buildings, especially in those built before the mid-1970s. Materials that contain asbestos may include sprayed on materials like soundproofing or decorative material, pipe insulation or other insulation, popcorn ceilings, patching and joint compounds, textured paints, roofing, siding shingles, uh, vinyl asphalt or rubber floors, and backing adhesives uh, used for installing floor tile. Repair, renovation, and demolition operations after a flood or other weather event can generate airborne asbestos. Asbestos fibers cause chronic lung disease or cancer. Asbestos fibers cause 10,000 lung cancer and mesothelioma deaths per year in the US. Lead-based paint is present, as I'm sure all of you know, in many older buildings and within deteriorated paint, interior dust, and bare soil. It's estimated that 38 million housing units still contain lead-based paint. After an extreme weather event, the need to rip out old materials can generate dangerous exposures. In adults, lead poisoning can cause poor muscle coordination, nerve damage, increased blood pressure, hearing and vision impairment, reproductive problems, and retarded fetal development. In children, lead poisoning is associated with brain damage and nervous system damage, behavior and developmental problems, and other issues. Carbon monoxide is the result of incomplete combustion. In the context of a response to a disaster or storm event, we are primarily exposed or potentially exposed to carbon monoxide through the use of portable generators and heaters, such as those that were widely used throughout the city, but particularly in NYCHA housing developments. Carbon monoxide is an asphyxiant. It's invisible, odorless, and tasteless, and because of that, it can kill without warning. So NICOSH is a technical expert group, it's an advocacy group, and it's, and it's a training group. We provide a variety of levels of training, um, including worker, volunteer, and DIY is do-it-yourself preparedness. We kind of frown on that, but you know, in, in a catastrophic widespread event like Hurricane Sandy or the World Trade Center disaster, in the real world, individual homeowners or apartment dwellers are going to be doing cleanup, and they need to know what the hazards are, they need to know what they can handle, they need to know how to handle it safely and effectively, and they need to know when not to do it. So we do that kind of training. We talk about how to identify hazards, how to control hazards, what are safe and effective work practices, what, what uh, personal protective equipment is appropriate and how you should use it or not use it. We organize and we, te and we train around workplace preparedness, and we also offer you know, the analogous training on organizational preparedness for unions, for tenant associations, for community organizations, for example. Uh, we also talk about resident and family preparedness, but re what we're really talking about is community preparedness. So for example, in, in, uh, in the housing authority where we're talking about multiple high-rise buildings that lost power, we're talking about uh, preparedness that entails not only putting together a go bag, for, your, for yourself or your family, but organizing the tenant association to identify vulnerable tenants to prepare in advance for how to deal with the situations that arise. And finally, we put that in the context of community sustainability. How do we encourage toxic use reduction in the community? How do we identify potential contaminant sources before a storm hits? Uh, how can we uh, um, reform the community through the use of green infrastructure? And how can we retain jobs and industry in the community rather than, than shutting down jobs because they deal with hazardous substances? So thanks very much. Look forward to talking with you. All right, so we have a, a few minutes. Um, I want to ask a question, Dr. Galvez. I'll, I'll probably need your help, your medical uh, opinion on this. So 
for the audience by a show of hands. Does anyone have an allergy to microphones? Please raise your hand if you have an allergy to microphones. All right, uh, public speaking, anybody have an allergy to public speaking? <laughs> Great, all right. So that means that everybody in here has the opportunity to ask a question. So we're now gonna open it up to any of our panelists. So I wanna see uh, and hear those burning questions and we'll start with the gentleman right here on the right hand side. Uh, Mike, is it on? Okay. Uh, let me thank uh, Peggy for her uh, inspiration and leadership here. I uh, wanted to bring up a couple of quick uh, issues for the panel. Uh, one is the uh, diesel truck idling on the streets, uh, creating uh, uh, particulate matter, which is, is not healthy. And if we could get enforcement from uh, the police to do their job in enforcing the laws, I think that'd be helpful. Uh, and rather than sealing up the buildings, uh, why not let buildings breathe? If they were originally designed in the World War I, World War II area, they're designed to, to breathe. Rather than sealing them up and having a, uh, a poor person or a senior who's on Social Security or limited income, who's going to pay that $150 um, air conditioning electric bill? doesn't make sense to me. Why not let the buildings breathe naturally? And finally, uh, there are volatile organic uh, chemicals which cause cancer. And they come from uh, laundry detergents. When you do your laundry and then in the dryer, the dryer uh, activates these chemicals. The source on this for the scientific people in the audience or others would be an article that appeared in Air Quality, Atmosphere, and Health 2011. And the title of the article is Chemical Emissions from Residential Dryer Vents During Use of Fragranced Laundry Products. That means cancer. So if you've got those cancer vents in your building, get them fixed. Thank you. So we have uh, three different questions that I heard come out of there. One was focused on the diesel truck idling. The other question was on, um, on letting buildings breathe naturally and the impacts when that doesn't happen. And then the final question was focused on VOCs. I could take the idling yes. one. So um, I heard a recent intervention recently that I thought was really fabulous, and it was around idling um, around schools. So drop-off time is a time when there are a lot of schools outside, uh, school buses outside idling, as well as um, personal vehicles. And what one school did was they actually had students go out, and they were the idling monitors, and they asked the people in their cars to turn off their engines while they were at drop-off time, and I think that can be incredible. So students have a powerful voice, and I think this was incredibly effective at reducing idling around the specific school. Thank you. Does someone want to take the question on uh, letting buildings breathe naturally? Sure. Um, uh, it's a very good question. Um, and to the point about the air conditioning, um, the air conditioning program that was the last uh, item there on the list is really for people with acute problems um, it, where extreme heat um, compromises their health. And it's in situations where they don't have a working air conditioner. And the, the question about, yeah, how do they pay for the use of that is a concern. It really is. But the choice becomes, and it's the resident who makes the choice, and who's eligible for a program that allows for an air conditioner to be put in. Um, so, you know, being health compromised or figuring out a way to pay for it, I think they want to choose to be able to figure out a way to pay for it first without dying. Um, and in terms of letting building breathe, um, that's always a, a, uh, on our minds. We're, we're not there to seal up the building like, you know, it's wrapped up in, in plastic. Um, the buildings have to have some level of um, air movement, and they always will. Um, we're never going to seal up a pre-World War II building to the point where it's going to be um, unhealthy. That's just not what we're about. But it's about reducing the infiltration to the apartment um, so that resident comfort um, is at a, at a reasonable temperature. Um, we're not 
having apartments that are overheated to 80 degrees where people are walking around in their shorts and t-shirts when it's 20 degrees outside, but a reasonable temperature, like 70 degrees, um, and you don't want it to be too cold either. And we see this all the time. So it's creating that balance so that residents are comfortable. And um, that's, you know, that's what it's about. And keeping, making sure that they're healthy. Great. And then we have one other question. Gavin, did, did you want to take a shot at the, at the um, diesel truck idling? Yeah, I was just going to say um, <clears throat> diesel truck emissions generally in New York City and, and idling in particular are, are real issues. Uh, there's, idling presents a particular challenge because you're permitted to idle for a very brief period of time. Uh, and so enforcement gets very difficult. Uh, in my experience, cops generally don't want to be dealing with idling issues, and it's a very sort of brief thing that happens, sometimes not so brief. But one thing that, that I wanted to mention is that, um, you know, one way to try to, to make some incremental improvements around diesel emissions is to figure out what types of uh, diesel fleets we, have act, we, ha we can regulate at a city level. So that's buses. Uh, that certain types of trucks. There was a there was a bill passed in particular that I wanted to mention last year that deals with uh, waste hauling trucks. The city licenses all waste haulers, and that gives the city an inroad for regulating the trucks that they drive. Most vehicles are regulated at the federal level. What they've required is a phase in of cleaner trucks that get uh, that get at a lot of the emissions. As trucks get newer, their emissions go down drastically, particularly post 2007, and so. One of the ways to think about that is to think about for different types of fleets, what legal tools do we have to actually regulate them at the local level where there's greater opportunity for making progress than there is certainly at the federal level currently. And for those of you who were here yesterday, there was a, uh, a presentation or a part of a presentation where there was some citizen monitoring that was going on around idling. So there was some information that was shared at that time. So I think we have a, uh, another question. I'm just going to ask, or two questions. I'm going to ask that you just ask one part to your question um, so that we can move forward. OK, thank First you. First of all, I want to say good morning. My name is Javier. I'm a tenant of New York City Housing Authority. And I want to thank you for being here this morning and providing all this uh, information, especially to me. Uh, my question, uh, more so for Mustafa Ali, uh, after Hurricane Sandy, uh, there was a mold task force uh, report given to Governor Cuomo and the state legislator. And within that report, the EPA has not established a standard of measure for what is um, considered uh, healthy mold or dangerous mold. There's no scale to determine. Mm -hmm. The EPA would not set a standard, so to speak. This precludes a tenant's right to bring a personal injury claim based on causation. Um, is the EPA now working on research to establish a standardized scale to help landlords be accountable through litigation? Mm -hmm. Well, to be honest with you, I'm, I don't work on mold as an issue, but what I can do is after this is over, we can get together. And when I get back to Washington, I will find an answer for you and, and we'll let you know what's going on in that process. No problem. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Thank you, all of you panelists. This has been excellent. And thank you, WEAC, for providing this experience. My name is Catherine Skopik. I am a WEAC member and a member of several environmental organizations. I have two questions, the first being a two-part question for Dan. Uh, you mentioned that one of your jobs is to reduce the carbon footprint of buildings. And I'm wondering if you work with both the New York Solar Map uh, for those buildings that uh, would be, uh, it would be efficient and beneficial to install um, uh, thermal so uh, solar energy. And I believe it was in 2011 that the New York City made it easier to install generative wind, such as VATS, uh, vertical access turbines on buildings to provide energy. The second part of your question is, uh, you mentioned <clears throat> that you convert buildings to gas, and I'm wondering about uh, any mediation you would provide for preventing the radon, because we all know that in fracked gas, uh, there's a high potential for radon being present in that gas. And then I do have a question for Gavin. Uh, this may be beyond your purview, and I sort of know the answer to this, but is there any way or legislation that we could work on to get the city to have industry clean up all brown fields and contaminated areas so that schools and all buildings everywhere, all of us, don't have to put up with this? Thank you. 
Okay, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a good batch. Um, so uh, for, uh, for solar and uh, wind, um, it's a bit of a challenge for the weatherization program. Um, it mostly revolves around cost. Um, solar has been more successful in parts of the country, uh, especially down south, where, um, where cooling is more of an issue and there's a lot more uh, sunlight uh, over the course of the year. Um, and he, here in New York, in working in multifamily buildings, um, you're challenged by siting issues, so where the building is located and what its orientation is. But it, again, it's mostly around cost. Um, and since we're, we've got building owners involved, um, it, it becomes a challenge with timing, cost, but it is possible, it has been done. Um, solar thermal, or the use of solar energy to produce domestic hot water, is the most cost-effective way to enter into that. Um, PV or photovoltaics um, is, another, is another way. It's less complicated, um, but the timing still is an issue. Um, we are actually involved with um, NYSERDA right now, New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, on a pilot project that we hope will be able to bring more solar um, to New York City through the weatherization program. So um, we're, you know, it's, it's on the radar. Wind, um, it's, it's, it's a little too far out there for us right now. Um, and uh, the other part of your question was? Radon, radon. yes, fracked gas. Oh my gosh. Um, what, a, what a conundrum to have to, to deal with, okay, um, diesel particulate fuel number two oil or heavy number six oil or fracked gas. It's like you're between the devil and the deep blue sea. Um, the, the problem is, is we don't, we can't tell a building owner how to use their fuel. We can minimize its use as much as possible. Um, there are no protocols right now for mitigating radon that comes through fracked gas into New York City. It is an issue that's being dealt with in the state legislature, um, which I don't think is being, hasn't been successful as of yet. Hopefully, um, Assembly Member Rosenthal, who's pushing that forward, um, is actually my Assembly Member, um, will have more success in the coming year. Um, so it's, it, it's a conundrum, and it's a, it's a, it's a philosophical, it's, a, it's a, an environmental, a social um, problem that, like I said, it, it's hard to solve. So the best thing we can do is reduce the amount of energy and the amount of pollution that a building puts out through the energy efficiency measures we do. Thank you. Uh, one second. Did you have an additional point? Yeah. Please do. Yeah, I wanted to respond to um, two of the questions. Uh, first, the, the earlier gentleman, I think his name was Javier, the issue of mold. Um, please do not expect or anticipate uh, any kind of mold exposure standard in, in the near future. It's not going to happen. The science doesn't exist for it. Uh, you know, mold is, 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 you know, are active biological organisms. We do not have, and we're not even we're near having, and we may never have a dose response relationship. So you're not going to get the same kind of there's, there's very little likelihood of getting the same kind of uh, legislation or standards regarding mold exposure as you would have for a chemical exposure, which is a single agent where there might be some science for how people get exposed, what they're exposed to, how much they're exposed to, and, and what the, the biological ramifications are. We're not gonna, we don't have those kind of relationships or science yet uh, with mold, so we're not going to get those kinds of standards, unfortunately. Uh, the second thing I wanted to speak to just very briefly was the issue of brownfields, and, and the woman asked about uh, brownfield cleanup. So the concept of brownfield, you know, is a gross oversimplification, but basically the concept of, ground, of brownfield is that we have, you know, a dirty area that's not contaminated to the extent that it would qualify as a Superfund site. So, so the goal, not my goal, maybe not your goal, but the, the goal behind the brown, brownfield concept is that it is cleaned up, but cleaned up to a certain level of cleanliness, and it's, and it's not pristine. So that's a political decision that's been made, you know, in the last 10 or 15 years. That's that's pretty much established, you know, has a legislative history and foundation. And uh, brownfields are supposed to be cleaned up to a lesser standard than other levels of contamination. And we have uh, one final question uh, in the back here. Uh, yes, uh, this is uh, Doug, Doug Briggy from Tufts uh, Medical School, and I, I spoke on a plenary yesterday about uh, uh, ambient pollution from uh, from high levels of traffic and highways and major roadways. And 
I just wondered if you could comment a little bit. The, the, the issue of, tr of diesel trucks idling uh, comes up frequently in the environmental justice movement, and I think it's a, a legitimate concern. But, but what I've learned in the research I've done is that the, it's the moving traffic, and it's not just the diesel trucks, it's also the cars that produce, uh, and I don't know what the percentage is, but at least 99% of the, the uh, traffic-related air pollution. And I'm wondering if you could comment on, on address, you know, extending the agenda to address that and infiltration of, of that pollution into, into homes and schools. Um, I will tackle the first, uh, uh, if I can. Um, who here knows of four buildings that sit atop the Cross Bronx Expressway as you approach or get off the George Washington Bridge? They're, they're affectionately known as the Bridge Towers. Um, and they have about 960 apartments. We were able to um, do weatherization in those buildings. We actually replaced the original windows that were there since the buildings were built in the early 60s. One of the uh, comments we got back from um, any resident who you know, wanted to feed back to us was the difference it made not only in the noise pollution that it reduced, because the original windows were single pane uh, aluminum type windows and we put in a double pane uh, window, um, but also that the, um, since the infiltration was, of air was also reduced, that their air quality was also uh, improved somewhat. Now, of course, we didn't have the resources to, to do a whole longitudinal study on people's health pre and post, but um, we like to feel that at least from the noise and somewhat from the air pollution perspective, those people were breathing in less toxins than they were before because they are, happen to be living on top of a major highway. Okay, and I'll just add one other thing to the, to the question around transportation. The Department of Transportation actually has an environmental justice uh, strategy that they put out each year. So your voices should be a part of that. Your comments, your concerns um, should be shared with them to make sure that they are continuing to strengthen that process. And that comes out of Executive Order 12898 that President Clinton signed a number of years ago where they are members of the Interagency Working Group on Environmental Justice. So I just thought I would share that so that you know that there is a, a nexus there as well. So if we could, could we give all of our panelists a round of applause? <laughs>